Bibles on to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to read, if you don't mind, verses 5 through 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 5 through 17. Actually, you know what? I'm not going to do 5 through 17. Well, yeah, I'll do 5 through 17. How about that? Let's do that. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? but ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, apostle watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers who are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which, ha which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have, laid no I have laid the foundation, excuse me, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day that will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test each one's work or what sort it is. If anyone work which he, which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone builds, if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he who him, but he but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Prayer has gone forward. Amen. We want to talk just a few minutes here out of 1 Corinthians chapter three just dealing with the anniversary amen and and about this particular passage of scripture uh if you all don't mind let me take these keys out of my pocket i hate when i feel like i'm heavy amen i when i'm preaching the word of god i, I hate when i feel like i got a whole lot of things in my pocket thank you deke amen um you all before i get started if you don't mind just a few introductions um i have deacon bobby who's with us amen I have Deaconess Mamie who's with us, amen. I have my wife, co-pastor Cammie. I have my Deaconess who's walking in the door right now, Ruby, amen. This is my opportunity to shine her, praise God. She loves to be the focus of attention, hallelujah, amen. She's the one who, she looks after us all the time, amen. Deaconess Ruby, praise God. Deaconess Ruby and Deaconess Mamie always look after us, and so does Deacon Bobby, praise God, so you know, everywhere we go, they're always traveling with us. Amen. Just to share in the blessing of the Lord. Praise God. And I thank God for uh, faithful and committed folks. Amen. Because those are the ones who are going to help you stand when nobody else is around. Amen. And I can talk about this today. And I am going to talk about this today because I'm going to share with you all what happens in the body of Christ and why it is important that we truly build on the right foundation in the Lord because a wrong foundation will cause that house to tumble. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. Anyway, here we are. We are in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And, you know, I just read 5 through 17. I know it was very wordy and very mouthy and a lot and very lengthy. But, amen, I just needed to get that out. You know, the significance, before I get in there, the significance of anniversaries, you all, this is something that I constantly remind myself, is that the significance of anniversaries remind us annually, praise God, of what it is that God has done for us and where he's brought us from. Amen. Because without him, we'll tend to forget. Amen. It is human nature for you and I to forget some things. There are some things that have happened in our lives that are very important and very significant that had we not had a date attached to it, we would not annually remember it. Praise God. You know, if we, if we didn't have a date for when we were birthed, Praise God. We would not remember how old we are. Amen. I mean, people just would not keep up with that. And so these things have just on Friday, my wife and I, we celebrated our 21st wedding anniversary. Amen. And so, 
You know, these things have significance and they have value and they have place in our lives because they remind us, amen, of some of the things that we've been through, where we've come out of, and where we're going. Hallelujah. And then when God sustains you in the midst of whatever it is that you're going through, amen, it is something worth remembering, praise God, because there will be some things to come, hallelujah, in your life that you need to remember what God did for you in the past so that you'll know that he's prepared preparing and working out your future. Amen. 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 Praise God. Those things are important to me. Amen. And so with us here today celebrating five years, I congratulate and celebrate you for standing for five years because many people just don't stand. Amen. They, they look at what they see in the natural and they begin to lose heart. Amen. Praise God. But when we look at things from a spiritual perspective, amen, and we trust and believe in Jesus, God does some great and mighty things. Amen. And so here it is, the Apostle Paul, praise God, he's dealing with a foundational issue in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and I'm going to make this as simple and as painless as possible. Amen. And we're going to work through this, and I'm going to share a few things with you, then we're going to go home and celebrate God. Amen. Because each and every one of us have an anniversary to when God delivered us. Amen. We can remember when God brought us out of the world that was destroying us. Amen. And so, even if we don't remember what we think we need to remember, one thing we should know is that we have a loving and saving God. Hallelujah. Amen. With that said, excuse me, with that said, here it is, the Apostle Paul. He's dealing with the issue here in the Church of Corinth, and we all know this, but I'm just going to talk about it anyway for a few minutes because it just makes sense. It's really encouraging for me, amen, because had not God had the men of God write these words in this book, I probably would have quit a long time ago, amen, because of what I experience and what I see. And so because of this, I'm able to stand and be encouraged and know that what has happened to me is not strange, praise God. What has happened to me is not foreign, praise God. What has happened to me, amen, she's giving me a mint, these, I mean the throat lozenges, I, I use these all the time at church, praise God, um, because my throat gets raspy rather quick. But what has what has happened to me is not a strange situation. I'm not in this fight by myself. Amen. I'm not going through anything that is unusual. Amen. Sometimes we, we experience some trials and tribulations in our life, and we think that we're the only one with that problem. Amen. Because the problem becomes so great and painful to us that we say, Lord, why me? But God shares with us that we're not in this fight by ourselves. Amen. We're not in this race alone. Think it not strange the things that we face. Praise God. Because others have suffered just as you and I have suffered. Amen. And if we keep our eyes on the Lord, we'll see the victory in the end. Hallelujah. But here the Apostle Paul, he's dealing with an issue to where there's a split in the church over whose baptism is greater. Amen. I mean, and here it is. Some are saying, well, I was about, I was baptized by Apollos and others are saying I was baptized by Paul. And so what people tend to do, and it's human nature, it's just how we're wired. Amen. We have an attachment to things in which we, which we can identify with, which causes us to group together and separate. Amen. I'll give you an instance because here, here it is. We have, I'll use Brother Bobby. Brother Bobby and I are racing together in the Lord. Amen. Praise God. And we share that one thing in common. But we're separated in the game of football. Hallelujah. He's a Chicago Bear fan. I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan. Amen. I know y'all ain't want to hear that, but praise God. But we're one and one together. I, I know that. I didn't even want to talk about the rest of But anyway, we, we, we're, we're, we're one in the Lord, but we're separated by things that we have an identity or an attachment to. And so here it is in the church, some kind of argument arose about baptism, amen. And what they begin to do is they begin to gravitate to the one who has baptized them because they felt that the one who baptized them had more power and authority than the other person, amen. They were so caught up in the individual, they forgot about the baptism, amen. They were so caught up in what Paul was doing and what Apollos was doing, they forgot why it was done. Amen. And so they forgot that the baptism was the very thing that brought us in the oneness of Christ, the beginning of a new relationship in the Lord, that we can call ourselves new creations. They're still caught up in a fleshly desire and behavior about who's the greatest. And because he baptized me, because he's healed more people, I'm a better person than you. And the problem with this is that it is really about sectarianism. Amen. It's about a separation in the body of Christ. It's about uh, uh, grouping up in small factions in the church that destroys the church. 
And so here it is, the Apostle Paul, he comes in and he brings about a change. He brings about an understanding of where we are and why we are. That because what Pastor Renzo Field does here and what I do over there, he is not greater than I and I'm not greater than him. We're on the same battlefield. Praise God. We're just doing a work in two different areas. Amen. It's not based on numbers in the church. It's not based upon who's doing what in the church, who got what money, who drive what car. It's, a, it's based upon he's watering, I'm sowing, and God is what? Giving the increase. But what happens oftentimes in that is that in the body of Christ, people can't seem to get away from themselves. They can't get away from the the I and me and the you and they, praise God. We, people in the body of Christ needs to understand that the power of God is so great and so awesome that the very things that we think separate us actually are the things that should be joining us together. Amen. Because we should come to a place of commonality to understand that we all got hiccups and we all got mess ups. Amen. We all got problems. Praise God. And that because of his love, we're delivered out of the very things that destroy us. And so while we're separating over foolishness, we should be coming together over faith. You hear what I'm saying? Instead of us separating over foolishness, we should be coming together by faith. Amen. But here it is, the Apostle Paul. Here it is. He, he, he's dealing with this issue, and he has to bring them to a place of understanding that what you're fussing and fighting about is, is, is irrelevant. It's foolish because it stops us from getting to the fifth year. Praise God. It stops us from getting to year two, three, four, five, six, seven, and whatever year. The things that we fight and quarrel about in the body of Christ are the very things the devil uses us to bring rifts and destruction so that we don't live according to God's principle, so that we're caught up wrestling over foolishness. Amen. I hear it all the time. I see it all the time. I'm dealing with it all the time. If it ain't in churches at the job, praise God. People, I just come to realize, guess what? People just ain't happy. I mean, people will run around and say, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen. And people will get excited about that only long enough to say it to realize that they have no power. The joy, if you think about the joy of the Lord, it, what makes God happy should be the very thing that causes you to keep on keeping on. If God is pleased with me, basically, when you think about that, if God is pleased with me, if he's happy with me, then God certainly is going to share his joy and shed his light upon my life. Amen. And so because I know that God is pleased with me, it's going to keep me going in the midst of what I'm going through. The joy of the Lord is my strength. If, if God is happy with what it is that I'm doing, then that happiness will translate into me keeping on doing what I'm doing for the Lord. Amen. Are you with me this evening? Amen. Praise God. So here we are. Here we are. He's dealing with what is called sectarianism. And what happens in sectarianism is, is this. We have this body of Christ together. Amen. And we come to church and we praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And we're celebrating the Lord. And we're shouting and we're dancing and singing. But in the midst of us trying to be on one accord, there's a small body of people in the midst of the big body of people who got a problem with some people in the big body. Are you with me? We've come here on Sunday to shout, dance, sing, praise the name of Jesus, and do the work of the Lord. Amen. But in the midst of us supposing to praise and worship God, our mind in the midst of service is on something that has nothing to do with why we're here. And so what happens is the devil enters into a gateway of our life. Praise God. Doesn't mean we're not saved, but the devil enters into a gateway of our life, a door that's been left open. Amen. Praise God. I'm going to preach about this one day when you leave the door open. Amen. And, and, you know, he enters into the door that's unlocked of our life. Amen. And so while we're here to be giving God praise, honor, glory, worship, and everything about how good God is because of what God has done for you and I and where he's brought us from all week long, we're in the midst of service caught up over some foolishness that don't pertain to God. When we should be in church talking about how good God is, we're in here talking about how bad somebody else is. Or what a person ain't in life. Amen. And how we can't stand this person. And how we wish we would never have came to church today. And so what, a sect, what sectarianism is, is it's basically a, a sect. It's a small group of people that's creating a faction, a breaking away from what it is that God is calling us to do. Amen. 
And so it starts with a thought. It starts with someone creating and, and sowing a seed of division among you. Amen. And then what it does is it spreads among other people who begins to identify through the natural eye with what it is that person has a problem with. And all of a sudden, this one group, they leave out of church after Sunday service. They go home, and they begin to talk about it. And so the seed then takes root, praise God. And then the root begins to produce a fruit or a tree or a behavior or an action or a pattern or something of that nature. And all of a sudden now you have a body among a body. And can I tell you all something about having two bodies in one? You're a freak of nature. I mean, you're a sideshow. I mean, if you got anything more than two arms on one body, you're a sideshow. You're a freak of nature. It's not normal. Praise God. This is what I'm trying to bring you up. Anytime you see a two-head lizard, it's not normal. If you see a two-head snake, it's not normal. Anything that has more than what it's supposed to have by nature is not what? Normal. And so when you have more than one body in the midst of a body that's supposed to be only one body, you have something that's not what? Normal. In fact, let me tell you all this. This is why the churches are the way they are today. This is why we have so many churches today, because church is not what? Normal. And I'm hearing more and more about it each and every day, you know, because here it is, and I'll be honest with you all, our church just went through a split. Our church just recently went through a split. Why? Because one or two people had a problem. They sold that problem among other people. Other people took somebody's problem and made it their problem and began to carry somebody else's baggage. And so what happened is a faction formed in the midst of the church. And everybody took sides because of friendship, not because of Christ. So they took friendship over Christ. Matter of fact, I'm going to put it this way. They took friendship over favor. They took friendship. They would rather side with somebody's problems and begin to create a problem in the body of Christ than to stand in the favor of Christ and see his glory manifested. And so the faction came, the split happened, and we lost probably about seven or eight of our leaders among some other family members as a result of a person having a problem. But don't you know that God knows that the problem was going to come a long time ago, and God has a remedy and answer for every problem? If the body of Christ would settle itself and hear out God, they'll see that the faction wasn't from God, it was from Satan. Who comes to kill, steal, and what? Destroy. We talk about that all the time. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And Christ came to give what? Life. And it more what? Abundantly. But we, we choose the destruction over the abundance. And so Paul is fighting within the church right now to correct the destruction in order that there may be abundance. And so here it is. I found myself in a fight over the last two months. I'm wrestling, and, and you know, this is what happens with sectarianism. Sectarianism, when the faction breaks off, amen, and the devil is very slick. I need to tell y'all something. The devil is very slick. The devil is slick. He's a, listen, there's nothing that you and I are going to get over on him. Praise God. Let me tell y'all something. We are not going to get anything over on the devil. My wife said it best one time when she was preaching. She said, the devil is faithful. Mess y'all. What? He never, he never stops. He he may go away for a second, but that joker is good. Even Jesus, even when he tempted Jesus in the garden, praise all out in the in the wild. People say, I'll tell you about that garden experience later on. But even when he tempted him in the wilderness, it says, for he left him at such a time that he may come back and tempt him. Again, praise God. And so listen, you may get him out of your life for a hot minute, a hot second, but that joke will come back. And so he's faithful. And so what he did was he'll get to people who's closest to you. See, the devil don't have to touch anybody that really don't mean anything to you. That's not anything that's that personal. I mean, that's not anything personal. You understand what I mean? You can have a whole lot of people in church. They come to church and they celebrate, and they don't really have a relationship with you. And so the, the hurt or the loss of them leaving really doesn't impact your life because you don't have a connection really outside of them just coming to church because the relationship hasn't been built. But what he does is he gets in the relationship with the people that's closest to you, 
and he destroys what's working with you all together. He pulls them out, and what happens is he gets you to start questioning who you are. For a minute, I was questioning who I was. I was, I was having, yeah, I was sitting at home wondering if I was a called pastor. I said, Lord, I didn't been look, I didn't go through this once. I went through this 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 faction thing twice. Here's what's interesting. I knew I was gonna be a pastor at 13. So why am I questioning myself at 45? When I knew at 13 I would be a pastor, but at 45 I got questions. In my youth, I was more wiser than I was in my elders, my eldership. How about that? But here it is. And so he works in the midst of the church to destroy the church because if he can destroy the church, then he can destroy the work of God. If he can destroy the work of God, then he can make God unhappy. That's right. He can get into, he gets at God through you and I. Do y'all know that? The devil has no other power or no other means by which to make God mad except for when he destroys one of us. Because God loves us so much that he put his son on the cross for us. And so the only way he can get at us is by coming to, the only way he can get at God is by coming to destroy us. Because he knows that you and I are more valuable to, to God than anything else that God has created in life. And so he comes in and he puts in factions and sectarianism to destroy us. And so here it is, Apostle Paul is saying, man, what I've done in the Lord is not important. And it's not more important than what God is doing in you. And so this thing about you being of me and somebody being of her and somebody being of this person, somebody being of that person, it's not of importance. What is important is the, laid, the foundation which is laid in Christ Jesus. And if we're laying anything else besides the foundation of Christ Jesus, then what we're laying is no good and not of God. And so what do we mean by laying foundations? When you allow people to come into your life and start sowing words of discord, deceit, destruction, or anything else that doesn't pertain to the glory of God and it's not about of his word, guess what? It will not only not stand, it will not last, and you'll be destroyed. Your life will be wrecked as a result of someone coming in and trying to give you something other than what Christ has already given us. Hallelujah. And so here he is. Now I'm going to get through this. I'm going to get through this. I'm going to move through this real quickly. If you all walk with me, I'm going to get through this and make this thing make sense to you. Now let me say this. Although the division here is over baptism, sectarianism is birthed in any issue, any issue that may arise in the church. Because people will find common interest or ground over any issue that will easily divide us. Our oneness... Uh, I divide us versus our oneness in Christ, which unites us. People will find a common interest. Um, I don't like Pastor Todd because uh, he dresses too well or he drives a uh, You know, can I tell you, oh, can I share some things with you? Let me tell you how silly people are. And these are things I ain't never shared with my wife because I try to protect her from foolishness. Can I, um, but I'm a... Are you protected, baby? Are you protected? I'm going to show. I'm going to, I'm going to show. I'm glad you grabbed it, Brother Bobby. Thank you, Deacon Bobby. Protect the Deacon Bobby. Let me tell you how silly people are. Some of these people who left my church. Do you know what one of their problems were? Now, we drive what? Two Suburbans. We drive a 2007 Suburban, and we drive a 2000 Suburban. Who has the newer one? Why does she have the newer one and you don't? Do you know people who left the church were upset that my wife drives a better car than me? Can you understand the foolishness? And this is why I say the church is so foolish. If they only knew that my name was the only name on both trucks, and it's my decision to make which vehicle I drive, what good man would have his wife drive the older vehicle? What good man would have his wife drive the older vehicle while he drives the good vehicle unless he's doing something that ain't no good? And you understand what I'm saying? Someone in the, it wasn't all of them, but some of them in the midst of that group had a problem with my wife driving a better vehicle than me. But let me tell you what the problem would have been had I went out and bought a Mercedes. The pastor's pimping the church. So you can't win. 
You can't win. No matter what you do, you can't win. So if we went out and bought some new cars, then they would simply say the pastor's taking the money from the church and all it's about is money. But because we didn't do that, and I'm driving a 2000 Suburban, and my wife is driving a 2007 Suburban, which we happened just to get by the grace of God, praise God, because we wasn't supposed to get it, and we just happened to get it. Because she never got a problem with what cars which one of us are driving. Now, I'm going to be honest with y'all. Had I drove in the 2007 and my wife drove the 2000, then they would have asked me a question. Why is the pastor driving the 2007 and his wife driving around the beat-up truck? So you know what the problem is? It's not the truck. It's not what we drive. It's the individual. Amen. They've left a door open that Satan has crept in and placed thoughts in their mind to bring a divide in the church so that the church should be what? Destroyed. So I don't look at the person and their issue. I look at the spirit behind the issue of the person. Are you with me? Amen. Amen. Here we go. Here it is. God unites us. In Galatians 3.26, real quickly. Galatians 3.26. Now here, we're celebrating that you've lived five years through the, the storms of life of ministry. That's what I call it. I call it the storms of life of ministry because there's some things that you're going to experience and have experienced, and there's some things that I'm going to experience and have experienced in ministry that just ain't nice. Just ain't fair. It ain't friendly. People ain't happy. They like to see things miserable. There's no joy truly in the Lord in the church. I'm watching churches all over the land split, divide, destroy, fall, crumble, crush, whatever it is, all over things that have nothing to do with the Lord. You know, I, I watched what happened over at Jericho City of Praise. Yeah. That was a fiasco. Yeah. I don't have all the inside information. I don't know everything that went wrong in there. All I know is that the body of Christ was divided. And God has never divided us. We're here, uh, Apostle Betty Peoples built the church with her husband. Her son has preached on the foundation forever and a day. And now he's ousted, she's died, and somebody else has the church, and the majority of the church is with the son. So they got to tell you something about the rest of the people. I mean, I'm not saying that he's 100% right. I'm not saying they're 100% wrong. What I am saying is what happened is not of God. It's not of God. And, what, and when it happens and it's put out in the news like that, it causes other people to say, this is why I don't go to what? Church. I don't go because the very thing I'm trying to avoid is happening in the what? Church. Because they're looking at the what? Church. Instead of looking at who? Christ. They got the wrong C in front of their face. They're looking at people and not Christ. I tell people all the time, they say, well, I'm not going to church because church is all messed up. I said, really? How messed up is church? Everybody in there all messed up got a problem. That's why I ain't going. I said, Really? I said, well, what better place to be? Do you stop going to the hospital when you get sick? Because everybody in the hospital is sick. And, they, 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 and most of them ain't their first time. They done got healed and came right back for something else. Why do you think people in church? They get healed of one issue and come back to deal with another what issue. Paul says, I die what? Daily. Why? Because Paul understands there's so many things attached to his life that it's a process that he has to get through as he's going on to his journey into the, into the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. I don't go to church because everybody in there messed up and, and all wrong and hypocrites. I say, well, I'm glad the church is full of hypocrites. That's what they say. That means we're in the right place. That's right. I mean, I don't really make fun of this thing about hypocrisy because it really, it really has its, 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 its place that destroys in the church because there are hypocrites in the true, true understanding of hypocrites to where you see one face, but then there's a different face of the individual. You see, you know, the hypocrisy of, of a father and mother celebrating God in church together and going home and fighting and all in hell and chaos. That's hypocrisy because we see one face in, in church and then at home there's a different face. And so the kid comes to church confused because what's happening in church ain't happening at home. That's true hypocrisy. But guess what? In the, in the, in the hypocrisy, uh, in the light of hypocrisy, the funniness of it all is, is that we all are two-faced people. And we are. Me, you, everybody else, we're all two-faced people. Why? Because we're dealing with two natures. 
we're dealing with a spiritual nature and we're dealing with a natural nature. I mean, we really are. We have a newness in life and we have an old life that we're trying to run from. But if you cross that old life, you'll get that old man. And I don't get the saved as of saved people. You will see the old man every now and again. Yeah. Praise God. Yeah, he's Listen, he's not buried in the sense of which we do when we put somebody six feet under. Amen. He's just surface deep. And my church hear me say it all the time. You scratch the surface, you see his face. He's smiling. He's waiting to get up. Amen. Let somebody cut you off in traffic. And you're having a bad day. And you're stuck in traffic. And your air conditioning ain't working. And it's 100 degrees outside. You mad because you sweating and you had a long day. And this food done cut you off. Tell me you don't get in your feelings sometime. Did they not see me right there? They didn't even use their turn signal. Some of us will drive on alongside of them and look at them. And peep them out. Amen. Just make sure they knew they did something wrong to us. We do that. Amen. And I talk about it all the time. I make light of that. Because we, after that, we'll turn on our gospel. We'll say, thank you, Jesus. And we'll sing the praises of the Lord while fussing somebody else down the street. That's hypocrisy. In the light of it all. Am I correct? Yes. Because we might give them the finger. Am I correct? Hey, see, y'all don't want to say amen to that because I'm going to tell y'all something true. Here's the truth of the matter. Christians ain't as saved as they think they are. It's a daily what? Progress. Now, I don't curse. I can tell y'all that. I don't give people the finger, but I do get mad. I do get angry. I will give you a good lashing without cursing if you catch me on the wrong day. Are you with me? Amen. Let's get off that subject. Amen. Praise God. Let's get back to the anniversary. Amen. I was going down the wrong street for just a long I, I praise God. But, but I, what I need y'all to understand is that we are where we are because of God, not because of us. And we can't allow people to come in and divide us over issues that don't belong to God. Because here in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 says this, For you all are sons of God through faith in who? Christ Jesus. For as many as you all were baptized in Christ have put on Christ. So why are they fussing about the baptism? Oh, this is the big baptism. Can I tell you one of the biggest baptism issues today? Well, the Bible says you're supposed to baptize in the name of Christ. Well, the Bible says you're supposed to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Who cares? They're all one. Really? They're all one. They're all one. But people are so caught up. Well, you don't get the power of the Holy Ghost when you don't baptize in the name of Jesus. Well, who is the Holy Ghost but Jesus? And who is Jesus and the Holy Ghost but God? That's why we have the Trinity. So it don't matter if you drunk them and say, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, or you baptize them in the name of Christ Jesus. It don't matter. They all are what? One. So why are we fussing over baptism? That's trivial stuff. We're all trying to get to the kingdom. We're all trying to race the same race. We may not get there together, but we're on our way. Things are so trivial. People are so caught up in foolishness. And this is why the church don't grow. This is why the church stays the way that it is. And this is why the church can't have the power that God has given it. Because we're so messed up on each other. We can't help those who we're supposed to be helping that are messed up outside of Christ. Yes. So we got two mess ups. We got a mess up in the church and we got a mess outside the church. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Let me move on. But listen to what he said. They're arguing over baptism. But here it is. He says, for we all are sons of God. For who have been baptized. We're all sons of God. Who have been baptized. We're all in Christ in one. Why are we in a fight? Over foolishness. And God gives us remedies on how to deal with issues in the body of Christ that we can continue to last to number year six. That we can go on to year number 13. Amen. That we can do the things that God has continued. Because I'm going to tell you something. God never plants for it to die. God never plants anything for death. He says, I'm not the God of the dead. I'm the God of the what? Living. So everything that God plants, he expects to what? Live. So he ain't calling you to die at five years. He's calling you to life, to year six. He's not causing me to die at year 12. He's calling me to die, I mean, to live to year 13. So God never plants to decrease. He always plants to what? Increase. 
Matter of fact, tell your neighbor, increase. increase. You got to believe that. You got to. Be- Let me share something with you all about increase. Amen. And, 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 and I need to share this because I need you all to understand that growth comes as a result of us constantly working the fields of God. Being diligent about the things of the Lord. It doesn't matter if it's in the church or outside the church. If it's God-given, it's meant for you and I to work. Now, let me give you all a little story real quickly that's interesting to me. Because you're meant to prosper. You know in the kingdom you're meant to prosper? I know y'all hear all these prosper messages, but I'm telling you something. As a child of God, everything you do is meant to prosper. Maybe not so much for your personal self and gain, but everything you do is meant to what? Prosper. And so God didn't plant you to die. He planted you to what? Prosper. Now, I know we're talking about being one in the Lord, amen, not being divided. But I just need to share this with you all about growth and development so that we don't lose. My wife and I, we have a business. Praise God. I'm a deputy sheriff, a pastor, a father, a coach, a husband, and a business owner. Amen. And so we've had our business established since 2005. Excuse me. We've had our business established since 2005. We have uh, our motivational speaking aspect of our business, and we have our personal logos. And we have one logo that's called Spot Me. And on the back of the shirt it says, Life Presents Challenges and Everyone Needs Support. And so we teach from that, but also that logo has kind of metamorphosized into some other things. It's now taken on a, a sports phase. It's, it's still motivational, inspirational, and all that other good stuff. And so we've been planting and, and working this vineyard since 2005. And we've been spending money on top of money and putting money in and not seeing the end results. Well, this year we're starting to see a change. A major, a change that's so deep, it's mind-blowing. Oh, yesterday, one case in point. Yesterday we were at a, a tournament in in. in uh, Virginia Beach. We were asked to come down and set a booth up and sell our, our merchandise, which, which pertains to Spot Me at this at this basketball tournament. And this is the second time we was there. We was there a month and a half ago. They were so impressed with us. They said we can come back for this tournament. And so we went down there and we set up for this this tournament. It was just a one day tournament. And this little white kid was so impressed with the message of Spot Me that he went and got a group of his friends and the parents and told them, "Come, y'all need to read it." Now this is a little white kid. He says, "You got to read the message. You got to read the message. You got to read the message." And he says, "My." father is going to love this a little teenager i just i laughed i'm not paying any attention to it so right as i woke up before i was coming here today i get a phone call hello uh todd stubblefield yeah this is jerry mccoy i said how you doing sir he says fine he says my son was so impressed with your message on yesterday that I had to call you today because we want you now to come set your 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 vendor's booth up at every one of our football games. We have nothing to do with football at this particular point. He says, your message is so powerful and it's something that carries such a, 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 a thought behind it. I want you to come set your booth up at all our home football games in Fredericksburg, Virginia. You're not being charged anything. We just want to see you grow. And so we're, 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 I'm sitting there, I, I, I jump out of the, I mean, I had already gotten out of bed. I had walked into the restroom, and I bust out laughing. My wife said, what's funny? I said, you can't believe what just happened. And see, what y'all don't understand, prior to this, on Thursday, we were at L.A. Fitness because we were, we're, we're launching our fitness line. And we're at L.A. Fitness, and here it is. A guy walks up to me. He says, I remember you. I said, yeah, I did one of your tournaments two years ago. You asked us to come do it. I did. He said, yeah, man. He said, that's great. I said, he said, how you doing? I said, man, the Lord is blessing us tremendously. We are growing beyond imagination, leaps and bounds. I said, man, it's just, I said, we have a fitness line that's going on and all this other good stuff. And so as I was saying it, it was just as if I paid this white guy to walk past. He says, hey, Pastor Todd, that shirt you got, man, that thing is awesome. I need a couple more from you. And the guy was me, he starts laughing. He says, well, you know, I run the largest basketball tournament in the Washington metropolitan area at Thanksgiving. Will you please come do the tournament free of charge? I said, really? He said, yeah, and you can have the rest of our tournaments. We got one on July 21st. And so I started laughing. He said, you ain't going to give us anything. Just come set your booth up. I said, wow, as we're leaving the tournament yesterday evening, the head man over that tournament yesterday evening, he says to us, now I'm going to show you all something that's really deep. He says to us, we have our annual meeting July, somewhere around July 15th. He says, and our annual meeting July 15th, it gives us, uh, we, we sit there and we plan out for everything that's going to happen after July 15th up until the next July 15th, their fiscal year. He says, so what we're proposing right now is that after July 15th, you give us a call so we can give you a schedule of the rest of our tournament so you can put us on your schedule. 
and we're not going to charge you anything. And so I'm sitting down there laughing, right? And so I'm talking to this lady down there who's buying a T-shirt because her son has her buying this T-shirt that she really don't want to buy, but her son really loves it. And so I'm just telling you about God, how you stay the course in the midst of these five years. You don't let sectarianism come in and divide you. And even if they come in and they try to divide and walk away from you, you stay the course, God will give you the increase. Amen. And so here we are, and we're sitting there, we're talking about And so I tell a lady about this line that I'm launching. It's called The Pastor. It's called a pastor. Amen. All the shirts are already made up. They're at home. And the pastor stands for physical and spiritual training organized regimen. And what is that all dealing with? That deals with spiritual health and physical health. One thing the Lord told me, and this is what the Lord shared with me, and I'm just going to be honest with y'all. The Lord, because I lost all this weight from last year. I lost 32 pounds from last year. Praise God. And I was unhealthy as a lark. I'm telling you, I was going crazy. My cholesterol is all over the charts. I thought I was having three heart attacks. Remember, I was talking about that, right? Well, the Lord, praise God. The Lord... The Lord laid on my heart the, the program called The Pastor. And what it stands for, again, is Physical and Spiritual Training Organized Regiment. And this is what the Lord told me a couple of weeks ago as we were putting this together to launch. He says, Todd, more people will have eaten their way into the kingdom of heaven long before I called them home. And I said, then I said, oh, my gosh. Because we allow food to overpower us. Yes. And so here it is. I'm talking to this woman at the table about the whole business, and she finds out I'm a, I'm a preacher, so she gets excited. And then I start telling her about the pastor line. She gets so excited, she invites us to come to Winston, North, Winston Salem, North Carolina in August to do their women's conference that's being, that's being held there. And she tells us, listen, you have free radio advertisement. You have free airtime to speak on the radio about your business, and we'll give you a chance to get on the stage and speak to the people about who God is and what you're doing in your company free of charge. And so what I'm telling you today is that, listen, we're meant to increase by God, not to divide and be destroyed, but to increase by God. And that's what Paul was trying to stop them from doing, was he's trying to stop them from decreasing and to increase in the Lord. We decrease when we divide, we increase when we come together. And so I'm telling you this because here it is. God says, he says, this issue of baptism, once you're baptized, it has nothing to do with anything else except for that you are my son and you're in me now. And so I tell you this, Pastor, because I want you to be encouraged that you keep on the battlefield because God's going to increase you. That's why the same thing with me. As I stay on the battlefield, he's going to increase me in spite of who left. He's going to increase me. And he's going to increase the church. And it may not be the church that we want in the sense of what we want number-wise, but guess what? He's going to give us the increase. You know, and I, I'm not going to go through the rest of these chapters that I have written down in scriptures, but you know, over in Luke, it does talk about forbidding sectarianism because here it is, here it is. The, 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 this thing is just really interesting to me. These jokers over here, the disciples talking about, Lord, we saw somebody over there casting demons out in your name. Should we stop them? I know Jesus probably looked at them with a puzzling look on his face like, are you out of your mind? I, if I was Jesus, I probably would have said, they get it. <laughs> And I, I probably would have said, but that's why I'm not Jesus, amen, because I probably would have hurt them young men's feelings. They're talking about, Lord, we saw somebody over there who's not with us, and he's over there casting out demons. Shall we go stop him? That's division. Just because he ain't necessarily walking beside us, he ain't right. That's why church can't grow. That's why church can't grow. Should we stop him? I saw somebody over there talking to somebody about something about the Lord, and it ain't their job. Really? You want them to talk about the Lord because evidently what they're hearing from the pastor is resonating with them, and they're carrying that message to somebody else, and that somebody else is coming into the house of the Lord to get what they got, and they can take the message to somebody else. That somebody else will come in the house of the Lord and get what they got, and they'll go, now you see the church what? Growing. We're going to go stop them. We're going to go to our church council together, and we're going to interview and find out what it is exactly that they're saying. Are you kidding me? Have you lost your mind? We're all called to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ. Whether we have a title or not, we're all called to spread the good news. But the church is divided over foolishness. But I want you to be encouraged just as I'm encouraging myself here today. 
as many as have left. And I got to tell you all something. And I don't mind sharing this. This can go on record. You can tell whoever you want to. My church seems to be so much more freer. With all the mess gone and all the drama gone. I'll take the smaller free church than I will the larger messed up church. That I got to come to church every day with my mind set on. I got to deliver somebody from some mess in a pastoral office counseling over something that's just crazy. As they say in jail, straight crazy. I don't know what that means, but just straight crazy. You just straight crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it's an oxymoron when you think about it. Yeah, straight and crazy. Crazy is all over the place. Straight is in narrow. It's just one, it, straight crazy. I, they, they tell you in a heartbeat in jail, you are just straight crazy. And that's what it is in the church. It's just straight crazy. And so I'd rather deal with the, what we averaging, about 50 or 60 now? Down from the 90 to 100 that we had built up to. One time we were over the 100 and we were doing all well and fine and we were happy because we had the multicultural church and we got the people coming in of different nations. And, to, and that's the great thing. I'm excited all about that. And all of a sudden, it's the different nation that had come in and gone crazy. <laughs> and I'm saying, oh, my Lord. I ain't talking about people. I'm just being real, you know. People got to understand that when we come together, we're coming together in the oneness of the Lord. It don't matter what you think, feel, believe, or what you uh, have experienced in your life. It's all about the delivering power of Christ. Amen. We are all here working it out together. We're all here trying to get it right. We're all here trying to get some baggage off our back that we can straighten up and stop walking around bent over. Amen. Thank you. Let me tell you. Let me share this and I'm, I'm going to close. Amen. Over in Luke 14. Turn there. Um, turn to Luke 14. I'm telling you to turn there. I'm losing my mind. I'm past Luke. I don't know what I was looking at. Or even what I was thinking about. Let me tell you what's going to help you and keep you from getting caught up in church mess church mess Moses was caught up in church mess and every time he was caught up in church mess he was running back to who? God and what God kept doing sending him back <laughs> to the church mess that, that ain't my problem that's what God kept telling Moses that ain't my problem Moses running up to God Lord them straight crazy people <laughs> They out there, they out there building gods out of gold and everything. They just doing straight crazy stuff. God, God said, that "Ain't my problem." Go on back. He said, "But your people." He said, "No, your people." <laughs> Amen. See, can I tell y'all something? God people don't act like Moses and, my, and our people. Amen. God people got a sense of humor and a sense of, uh, of, of, of understanding of who God. God says, "No, those are your people, Moses." I gave you those people, Moses. The only good thing for you and I, Pastor Fields, is that Moses had 200,000 to contend with, a mega church, and he was losing his mega mind. Amen. To the point where Jeffro had to come up and say, man, you got to do something better than this. His daddy-in-law came up to him and said, hey, listen, man, you got to go and get you some appoint people and appoint them over some people. So you can... <laughs> Moses, he would hear so many problems, he would go back. It's just, it's just funny when you look at how things are laid out scripturally. Amen. But to prevent you from getting caught up in mess in church, here it is in Luke. This is what Jesus says in 1425. He says, now a great multitude went with him, and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brother and sister, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my what? Disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my what? Disciple. And I'm going to stop right there for a second. I'm going to stop right there for a second. Because God don't expect me to hate my wife. He don't. He don't expect me to hate my mother, my father, my sister, my brother. He don't expect me to hate them. He expects me to hate the nature of them. That foolishness of them. He wants me to love them, but he wants me to hate the foolishness of them. In other words, when my mother and father comes in or my wife comes in and try to cause me to do something that's outside of Christ, 
This is why he talks about bearing your cross. So they tell me, my, if my wife was to ever come tell me, well, <laughs> we ain't going to church today. No, you're not going to church today. You're a grown woman. What you do, you do. But what I'm doing, as, as, as Joshua said, for me, and he said my house, but I got to just say for me, for me, I'm going to serve the Lord. I can't make her do anything. You never know when you go through a Jose experience. Amen. The woman of your eyes turn out to be somebody else's prize. Amen. You understand? <laughs> you, you understand what I'm saying? Well, you, 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 you never know when you're in a Jose experience. I tell people that you never know when you know the woman who you marry and you think is all right, but she ain't all, all right. She ain't with you on the same page. We know that Jose story is all about God showing his redemptive power. But beyond that, there's a whole lot of people in Jose marriages. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. But here it is. Here, he says, if you're not willing to bear, so what keeps you out of the divisions and the divide of church is when you're not more connected to the person than you are to Christ. If the person does not mean more to you than Christ means to you, people will disappoint you. People will set you up for failure. People will love and leave you at the same time. And so here it is. If, if these people, this is why he says, if you don't hate them, you can't be my disciple. He's not talking about the person. He's talking about the makeup of the individual, the things that causes them to separate from him, the things that will cause them to separate you from him. If you don't hate that and you go with that more than you stay with me, you can't be my disciple. And so here it is. The people who left my church all didn't leave for a good reason. They left for friendship and family reasons. And so you're telling me that person who's trying to remain saved is more important to you than Christ who's called you to the church to be saved and to work within his vineyard to see other lives saved. So when they walk out the door, if you're walking out because you're attached to that individual, then Christ says, you can't be my disciple. You're in a dangerous place. You can't learn from me. In other words, what he's saying, you can't learn. He didn't say you weren't saved. He said, you can't learn from me. A disciple is nothing more than a what? Student. You can't learn from me when somebody else has your ear more than I do. And if you can't learn from me, your life is in a destructive mode. The devil got your hind pots. And so here it is. And so he's talking about bearing. So you have to bear your cross. And what does bear your cross mean? That means that if, 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 if Pastor Fields and I were homeboys, grew up thicker than thieves together, and I'm going down the street, and all of a sudden, he see me kirk out. And somebody say something to me. And I flip my wig. And I'm talking about, I'm going to whoop this person's hind pots. And I look at him and say, you with me? And he turn around and say, yeah. Because we homeboys. But he's saved. Then guess what? He can't be Christ's disciple. Because my foolishness is more important to him than the work that God is doing in his life. And so here it is. His cross has to be bore in the fact that he has to say, Todd, I ain't walking with you in this, man. This ain't God. We've been delivered. This is bearing your cross because bearing your cross means an argument's about to come. A fight is about to come. Now we're about to divide. You ain't got my back. Did you see what that dude said, did to me? It ain't about that no more, brother. We're delivered from that. God, that's not the, that's not the weapons of our warfare. Our weapons are not carnal. They are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. You need to get that thought out of your mind that's causing you to want to go fight because God has delivered us. We have new minds. We are new creatures. We are new creations in Christ Jesus. You need to walk away from what you're getting ready to get into because what you're getting ready to get into is going to bring you a harvest that you ain't ready for. And so now he has to bear his cross and say, I'm separating from you. I'm willing to give up my friendship with you for the name of Christ Jesus because what you're in is not God. I was in my meeting, and I was in my meeting with those people who was getting ready to leave the church. They were talking about leaving the church, and one person said, well, I'll just leave. I said, well, what's, about, what's holding you back? <laughs> really? Pack your bag, slick. For real? You think you leaving? You giving me an ultimatum is going to make me change my position? Have you lost your mind? Well, how are we going to work this out? We're going to do it God's way according to the word. You know what somebody said to me in the midst of that meeting? Well, what if that don't work? Then everything we build our lives upon it's foolishness. If we can't work through the word of God, 
to rebuild the kingdom of God, then God's a lie. Or you are not who you say you are. And I'm going to go with you are not who you say you are. And that Christ is not a lie. So I'm going to tell you something about people. When people start giving you ultimatums and you start taking the ultimatums, people are going to start running your life. And can't nobody run me but Christ. Can't nobody run me but Christ. I tell my wife all the time, and we have a great relationship. Ain't nothing wrong with us. We ain't arguing, we ain't fussing, we ain't fighting, we laugh and kicking, and we have a good time together. But I tell my wife anytime, anytime you feel you need to leave, you roll out. I don't tell her that all the time. I'm just, you know, I'm just saying, you know, I'm embellishing. But, you know, I, I, I don't want my wife to leave me, for real, for real. <laughs> But, you know, a man finds a wife, finds a good thing. I live by that. Amen. Praise God. And, and, and Yeah. And we're in the same car. Praise God. I need to ride home in her 2007 because my 2000 at home. Amen. Praise God. But anyway, that's a joke. But, <laughs> but the reality of it all is, you know, I, I told my wife, if she ever decided to leave me, I ain't mad. I understand. I'm hurt. But I ain't going to Kirk out talking about I'm coming to kill you, the kids, the dog. And everything else live around you, and I ain't fighting you over no guy. And all. No, I understand. If that's what your heart desires, that's what you have to do. I ain't stopped living for Christ for nobody. Because I know I used to be a hell raiser in the streets. I know how crazy I was. I know some of the stuff I got myself into that I couldn't have not quite possibly gotten out of if it wasn't for God. So why am I going to give up the deliverer? I ain't giving up the deliverer. The deliverer, the one I'm going to need tomorrow. Can I tell y'all that? Today is the day, but Monday brings his own troubles. I need him tomorrow. He's getting me through today, so why should I give up my anchor that's going to keep me for somebody else who want to leave me? Straight crazy. Straight crazy. As I close, I, I love this because, you know, the way we keep ourselves out of the mess that destroys us and keeps us growing right here is that when we lay the things that we lay on the foundation of Christ are Christ. Not ourselves, not our flesh. But you know, I, I I remember I told my wife I was leaving her. A year and a year and a half, two years after we were married. I'm gone. I'm out. Peace out. Roll. See you later. We gone. That was nineteen years ago. <laughs> I'm still leaving. Praise God. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's before we had kids. Two years in the marriage. I'm gone. I'm out. I see deuces. I'm out, sweetie. I'm, I, ain't, I ain't going for this no more. You ain't going to take me through this no more. I ain't, I ain't tripping. For real. Because I'm a grown man. They ain't, they ain't the words I used at that time. You know, I used some other words. But I'm a grown man. I'm gone. You think you're going to treat me like this? Oh, no. And here's my thought. There's some other women who want me. It will treat me better than this. That's how I felt. That's just how I felt. I mean, I really did. And so my wife said, okay, well, I'll be here when you get back. <laughs> she told me, I'll be here when you get back. I'm like, yeah, okay. I use, our favorite, I use our favorite saying, hell will freeze over before I come home. It is hot outside. Amen. And in the words of, um, of Shirley Caesar, ain't no use to me living in hell on earth and die and go to hell. Amen. I just all say that just to say that hell ain't froze over. Amen. And I'm still at home. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> Living a better life. Why? Because somebody had good sense. She could have easily said, well, you know what? You go. I'm gone too. She could have easily said, oh, somebody wants you? They want me too. Just as many women want you, men want me. She could have easily said that. But see, this is when you got to learn to bear your cross. And you got to learn to stand. And you got to learn to separate yourself from foolishness. She says, I'll be right here when you get back. Praying for you. I ain't never coming home. I ain't never leave. <laughs> it was all lip service. Praise God. I'm trying to divide the house, not paying attention to what the devil doing. And somebody in the house got sense. Amen. And so when people now, now, now oh, thank you, Jesus. Let me let me do it. Let me deal with this. Let me done. Let me, now, here, let me, here it is. People are trying to divide in the church. And they're dividing over because of me and my wife, foolishness, amen. Some things they don't like what my wife do, and they don't like how I handle certain things in church. And so here they're trying to divide. And so here they're trying to bring something into place to say about um, 
what it is that she is and she is not doing, and why am I allowing these things to happen, X, Y, and Z. But here it is. This is a woman that I tried to walk out on, and she went to God. What better person do I want in my life than somebody who's going to go to who? God. Why would I throw her away for your straight crazy self? And all your foolishness. Why? Why should I let what you think is junk become somebody else's treasure? Have you lost your mind? Have you lost your mind? And so here it is. We can make it to five, six, seven, eight, twenty, thirty 20, 30 years as we continue to build on the foundation and not get caught up in the foolishness of people's flesh. People come in, and this is where you got to divide at. When your family and friends come to church, they can't be more important to you than Christ Jesus. Now, if I was straight crazy as a pastor, then yeah, you should divide what your family and roll out. But if I'm preaching the word of God and I'm teaching you how to live according to the scriptures and your family get upset or your friends get upset over something stupid, and they're talking about, I'm out. I'm out at 5,000, as they used to say back in the day, rolling down the road. You should tell them, see you. I'm out. I'll let you go. Peace out. I love you. We'll be together. But this ain't what God has called me to do. Many of our blessings and many of the things that God's going to do in our lives are attached to the work that we do in the vineyard. And if we're willing to give up the vineyard work because of what people feel, that we should be doing, we miss out on the blessings of God. We miss out on his promises. And I was telling y'all about the business aspect of things because years ago I could have given up when I didn't see things moving. I've, I've, I've put thousands of dollars into that business. Thousands of dollars. Thousands of dollars. Now I'm seeing the end result come about. I've put time and effort into the church. And so as much as I've lost money, there's going to be people I lose along the way. It's not that I don't care. I do care. It's not that I'm not hurt. I am hurt. But I'm not going to stop because some people choose to fall away. Because some people choose to walk away. I'm not going to quit. I'm going to keep on preaching the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going to keep on teaching the Lord. And, it, you know, I had, a, I had a meeting with one of my leaders this morning. And I was telling my leader this morning, I said, and we were talking about this same situation. I said, if them people decide to come back in church, I'm all right with that. They can come back. But they won't come back in the same foolishness in which they left. You better believe that one. I'm going to get them at the dope. I'm going to check their membership card, see if it's valid. See if they got their situation updated in Christ. Because I'm not going to let that come back into the church no more. I'm, they, they're not bringing that back to the church no more. When people leave, when you come back, you come back with a repentant heart unto the Lord. And you give God all the glory and praise for delivering you. And bringing you to a right mind. And if you don't come back here, you go somewhere else. And you keep your mouth off the church in which you left. You don't know what God is doing. You don't. Yeah, I, I don't play that stuff. We talked about that one on the phone, didn't we? We talked about a person. I said, I think you should know this. Didn't I tell you that on the phone? I don't play that. I ain't no picky boo stuff with me. I'm not into people like that, for real. I don't put my hope and trust in people. I called him over a situation about a person that he knows, the person I know. I said, hey, Pastor, I think you should know this. Have this person told you this? No, they haven't told me. I said, well, you should know this. Because we're on a battlefield together. Amen. Yeah. Because people come and go over foolishness. They don't like it because my head bald. I'm growing hair. Are you crazy? But, you know, the reality of all is our life is built upon this word of God. And if this is not what we're living, if this is not what we're standing on, if this is not what we're preaching, if this is not how it's going, our life is going to be governed, then we have nothing else. And if we're going to live by this, then let us what? Live by this. Not when it's comfortable or convenient, but when it is right. I'd rather be wrong. I'd rather be wrong all the days of my life that Christ might be right than me to be right and let somebody else's lives go wrong. I'm just being honest with y'all. I really would. If I, that means, in other words, that means I'm always going to be, that means if I got to sacrifice for somebody else's life to be right in Christ Jesus, he talks about that over in Romans chapter 15. We have the scruples of the week. And, you know, and at the end of the day, you guys, we, we have to fight for one another. We have to pray for one another. 
to always be on the battlefield for one another. Because if we don't, then guess what? Our lives will be destroyed, just as his lives are being destroyed as well. Because we're all interconnected with one, through Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.